Nicolas Cage is probably one of our generation's definitive actors. Hello and welcome to Cage Fighters. It's your main man, Andy Gillard here. Hope everyone's keeping well in the world right now. Hi everybody, Matt Guy here. Hope everybody is ticking along just nicely. You're ticking along just nicely is the kind of theme of the summer. Hello everyone. Fellas, we've had rain, like the amount of times we've spoken about the heat and we've had some rain. Oh, it's lovely. Actually went outside and enjoyed the cold rain on my bare flesh the other night. It was wonderful. <laughs> Sick of on your bare flesh. <laughs> uh, but we're here anyway to discuss a Nicolas Cage film from 1983 called Rumblefish. Uh, it is a film directed by his uncle, Francis Ford Coppola. Um, it's one of three films he's done with Coppola that we need to watch. We'll also have The Cotton Club and Peggy Sue Got Married. Now, I know of Peggy Sue Got Married, but Cotton Club and Rumblefish, no idea. Never heard of them before. Stu, is this new for you? Yeah, exactly the same. Um, Peggy Sue Got Married, I watched a long, long time ago. Uh, but Rumblefish, I mean, even when Matt asked... <laughs> what this film was called, even though I'd watched it the other day, I still had to look up what it was e- we'd even watched. And <laughs> that's, as you find out, that's no slight on it. It's just a really fucking odd film. <laughs> but it is a strange one. No, I mean, we've done a lot of these where no, you know, no one's heard of it, but the acclaim that this seems to have and the people who are in it and no one has heard about it, it's quite weird, really. Especially the kind of arty kind of, well, <laughs> Andy Gillard film that it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matt, is this new? Did you have any hopes and fears going into a Francis Ford Coppola film? Uh, it's it's certainly new. I think with the prestige that comes behind Francis Ford Coppola, I expected uh, I expected something long, arching, maybe slightly long winded, but overall quality um, was my expectations. Um, but knowing it was in black and white made me instantly think, mm, is this some kind of arty-farty nonsense? But we, we'll, I'll reserve judgment until I watched it, was my initial thoughts. Uh, yeah, Lung and overarching is very much a theme of um, Coppola's work. When you look back at, obviously, we've got The Godfathers. <clears throat> Each of them goes well over two hours. Um, Patton, The Great Gatsby, the original version. Apocalypse Now and all of the versions of that film. Bram Stoker's Dracula, Jack... Like, he's a director who is often cited as one of the greats, but with that certainly comes a, a certain weight to his films. Um, Stu, you mentioned the cast. There are nine Oscar-nominated actors, including two winners in this film. Um, the two winners would be Cage, obviously, and Sofia Coppola. Matt Dillon, Mickey Rourke, Diane Lane, Lawrence Fishburne, Dennis Hopper, Tom Waits and Diana Scarwood, who I've got to admit, she's the only name on that list I don't know. But you see that cast and like I was hooked immediately seeing that's what I'm going to be watching. Yeah, and that's this is what I said to my brother as well when I was trying to describe it to him before I'd watched it. And I said, I did what I just, literally just said, you read the cast out and you, he was like, I've never even heard of this film. And it took me a while because I'd glanced at it and like, Lawrence Fishburne... <laughs> Being that young, seems it, it, my mind couldn't compute with it. I mean that, and the <laughs> fact that Mickey Rourke looks like a human being as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was off putting in in the wrong way because they look normal <laughs> rather than what, especially in Mickey Rourke's case, what they are now. It's a really really odd situation to be in. <laughs> mm. I mean, obviously, Lawrence Fishburne got his first appearance on film, I believe, in Apocalypse Now. So he has worked with the director before. But when you look at... I mean, I watched John Wick last week. When you look at (laughs) Lawrence Fishburne then to now, it's... Yeah, it's mad. Matt, what were your thoughts on the cast? I mean, it's absolutely chock-a-block, isn't it, really, of, of, of potential? I know... 
the same. I barely, barely could recognise that it was Mickey Rourke, to be honest. And I've been recently re-watching um, and listening to a lot of, basically listening to Chris Jericho's podcast and then watching the, the footage and the whole WrestleMania thing that he did with Mickey Rourke and, um, and then watch The Wrestler. And it's just, it's two completely different human beings. Like, they are not the same person. Um, you know, it's like Robocop. <laughs> like Mickey Rook now is at the Robocop of this of this Mickey Rook in this film but you know it's a great cast and you expect that with a cast like that you know you expect a certain level of of, of product at the end of it um, do we get that? well that's what we're here to discuss mm-hmm. that segues us wonderfully to IMDB describing this film as absent minded street thug Rusty James struggles to live up to his legendary older brother's reputation and longs for the days of gang warfare. I don't understand. Why do you hate him so much? Huh? Well, I hate him so much because you kids think he's something he's not. You always try so hard to be like your brother, Rusty James. Hey, my brother's the coolest. What if the motorcycle boy came back and found out? The brother ain't back, man, all right? I don't know when he's coming back, if he's coming back, so if you assholes want to wait around for the rest of your life to see what he says, fine. The motorcycle boy. I wonder why somebody hasn't taken a rifle and blown your head off. Well, even the most primitive society has an innate respect for the insane. He's really this cast to play. Born in the wrong era, on the wrong side of the river. Man, me and you, we, we could have run this whole side of town if you just gave me a chance. You know, we'd all be better off if you'd stayed gone. If you're going to lead people, you have to have somewhere to go. The film opens in Benny's Billiards. In walks Midget, that would be Lawrence Fishburne's character, who tells Rusty James, Matt Dillon, that the leader of a rival gang, Biff Wilcox, wants to meet him and fight him that very night. Rusty James accepts the proposal and seeks counsel of his friends, BJ, Steve and Smokey. Smokey is played by an 18-year-old Nicolas Cage with the biggest hairdo we've ever seen on this podcast. <laughs> His friends point out that Rusty James's brother, the motorcycle boy, played by Mickey Rourke, will be upset with this fight after he previously brokered a truce between the gangs. Before he left two months ago without any explanation or indication on when he will be returning. Rusty James visits his girlfriend, Patty. She tries to talk him out of fighting, telling him that he's trying too hard to be like his brother. Rusty James denies this, saying his brother is a smart man. After visiting his girlfriend that night, Rusty James meets with his gang and reaches the scene of the fight. Rusty James is winning the fight, beating Biff to a bloody pulp when the motorcycle boy arrives on his motorcycle, which is not the most subtle of things. This distraction causes Biff to get the upper hand where he stabs Rusty James with a shard of glass. In his rage, the motorcycle boy sends his bike at Biff, knocking him down. From now on, I'm just going to call him MB and Rusty James is now just Rusty because the amount of times those names get used Uh and appear in the script is absolutely ridiculous. MB and Steve help Rusty back to his house where they nurse him back to health. We get a conversation between a convalescing Rusty and Steve where they explain that MB is 21 years old, colourblind, partially deaf and noticeably aloof, which leads others to believe that MB is insane. So that's the first act clocking in at around 22 minutes. Stu, what are your thoughts on the opening here? This is mental. <laughs> that was my, um, my first thought. I mean, it... Some of the shots, it, I don't like the, like the kind of semi fisheye camera kind of look. You know what I mean? When it's kind of where it's like a, it's positioned mm. high up, looking down on things. I don't generally like that. It's all very 
Like I said, it's almost too art house. It's too much. But with this, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it at all. And I think he kind of... It was such a... Hmm. It was maybe such a departure for all the other stuff from... Or you, you compare The Godfather, which we talked about, I, I watched about six months ago. You compare how that film looked to how this looks, and it's a complete opposite, the completely opposite thing. And this was more mm-hmm. like The Warriors than, than that. And I love The Warriors. And up until the, the, the PS2 game, no one had even heard about that film. Um, but yeah, I was really enjoying... The only thing I wasn't enjoying was, like you just said, every single... Every two or three minutes, someone saying Rusty James. Why? Why couldn't they just call him like, Rust or <laughs> whatever? It it was really bizarre. And yeah, yeah. When the guy, <laughs> the guy in the bar at the start, where they were they were sitting on the tables, and he he was just looking and saying, oh, I "Pretty much, don't do that." And they just ignored him, and he just carried on, just drawing the glasses and cleaning up, and like clearly they don't pay any attention to this guy. <laughs> And you think, oh, okay. So they've got ideas about their station here. And that I think that would kind of emphasise throughout the whole film that a lot of these people had ideas about the station. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Matt, what did you think of the opening? Um, I thought it established <laughs> itself pretty quick, bringing in the motorcycle boy. Um, and, you know... There was some interesting dialogue between the characters of the gang. Uh, it started off okay. I was, uh, I wouldn't say I was intrigued, but I was keen to know where this was going and how much of the Warriors can it rip off. I'm not sure which one came first. But um, I, I did think to myself, mm, okay, okay, this doesn't seem like the art house bollocks it, it, it should be. Um and then when they introduced the motorcycle boy, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I hadn't wrote it off at this point, put it that way. That's fair. The the Warriors was four years earlier. Okay. Yeah, just just look, nineteen seventy nine. There's a well, it's funny because well, I'll mention it later. There's another film that was released in nineteen seventy nine that this film bastardizes all the way through. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Okay, that'll be interesting. Uh, Rusty goes to a party thrown by Smokey where he has sex with someone other than his girlfriend. This gets back to Patty, who breaks up with him. Things start going badly for Rusty. He gets kicked out of school for fighting and wants to resume gang life. MB tells him that he has no desire to return to his former ways. He doesn't want to lead people into fights. He just wants to live. That night, MB, Rusty and Steve hit a strip of bars, initially enjoying forgetting his troubles. MB soon tells Rusty that he located their mother whilst he was away. She's a movie producer now in California. MB says that he understands why their dad always says that he reminds him of their mother. Then MB implies that Rusty is like their alcoholic, welfare-dependent father. Steve and Rusty drunkenly walk home, getting themselves attacked before MB arrives to beat down their assailants. While nursing Rusty once again, MB tells him that the fights and the gang life aren't what Rusty thinks. They're not something to idolise. Uh, so we get the second act there, which is the real meat of this story. I, I really enjoyed the character development here. Rusty James being so overtly desperate to emulate his bigger brother. When his big brother just wants to try and become his own man and leave behind the boy he once was. Uh, the scene at the bar where Rusty James saying to that uh, the, the guy that they just randomly meet, I'm going to be like him, I'll look like him. Yeah. And the guy <laughs> just sort of laughs at him, just scoffs at him as if to say... He says, like, he's a prince. You, you're nobody. Like, I really liked that interaction between them and the character growth I thought was fantastic. Matt, how would you coping in the middle? Um, oh, I hate to disappoint, but I just, just so turned off from this film so quickly. The issue is it's, it's a simple story that has been done a thousand times before and has been done a thousand times since. Not got an issue with that, but this is a case of why say 500 words when you can say it in 50. This is his entire film (laughs) in a nutshell. Like why it's just, it's, it's almost like there was a, there was a a memo that went out, like let's interpretive dance everything that we can possibly do in this film. (laughs) 
<laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was it was it was just arty for the sake of being arty. And I know there is a place for that, and some people enjoy it. And Christ, some people fucking love this film. But it's just it just didn't work for me. It was it you know we've we've seen films where people struggle with their their father figures, and we've seen films where people aren't able to live up to the you know the light of um, the, their brother the godfather with like fredo and michael and everything else like we've seen that before it doesn't need to be this like mad arty nonsense and don't get me started on which i mean everybody will know this as the schindler's list thing this whole color on the back of black and white oh come on to quote to quote roy Keane, give me a break <laughs> just, like, it's just what you like it doesn't do it i don't i I, it just doesn't do anything for me i know like if i understand that he's colorblind but should like it would have made made more sense of being more impactful if we'd have gone colorblind when we meet the motorcycle boy because we're seeing then the world through his eyes and everything else that comes with it or you know i don't know it just sometimes i see that and i just it just makes it just makes my eyes roll because i just think okay this is arty nonsense, and because it's done, we're expected to kind of appreciate it for being something. I mean, actually, in the cold light of day, like we should just call a spade a spade, and it's arty nonsense. I mean, it's almost like role, role reversal. You've always been, been possessed by me. <laughs> um, I think when he was saying that, when he was saying in the bar, when he and he. Like you said, I mean, about the um, you're not going to be him. I think when he said you're you're not going to look like him, and he looked really pissed off at that point. And you think, uh, well, you're clearly not going to look like Mickey Rook, who looks like the most handsome man in the entire world ever at this point. <laughs> Are you just not. And I think that was kind of like a turning point to me. I thought, oh shit, yeah. From he he's got the looks for this. He didn't. From what he was. From what. Rusty James, Rusty James, Rusty James. What he, <laughs> what RJ was saying and what he was thinking seemed to be a completely different person to what his brother actually was. Because he seemed like he was kind of like, he put him on a, this massive pedestal. And he, at no point did we get any kind of indication that he was this super hard gangster. And he, he maybe he was more, <laughs> he wasn't Roy Keane. <laughs> maybe that, that, was, that was not his style. Maybe he was more, intimidating for other reasons that we don't actually see. Um, but people could clearly respect the guy and maybe he's done it in the past. But from what we saw with him there it was a completely different person to what we've been describing for the first hour of the film. It was, it was madness. And I thought the whole color thing, I don't like the color thing either, but, and I don't really understand the, the whole, why only the fish are the color bits doesn't make any real sense, but it's a bit like um, Better Call Saul, how the future parts in that are in black and white rather than the other way around. So it's a prequel series, but the future stuff's in black and white, so it's inverted from what you expect. So as you, as you, the series goes on, and it's obviously it's over now, um, but as it goes more towards the events after Breaking Bad in that series, you get more of the series that's actually in black and white that's happened after the, after the fact. So... It's all a bit odd, and I don't see the point of it there, and I don't really see the point of it here either, other than to be arty. But in this case, I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it works perfectly. I don't understand it, but I think it works perfectly for this film. (laughs) Excellent. Rusty James and Steve are in Benny's billiards once again when Smokey walks in with his new girlfriend, Patty. Smokey admits to Rusty that he set him up at the party so that he could move in on Patty. This scene between Nick Cage and Matt Dillon properly brought out my inner film student. <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. I, I really liked them two stood in front of the the glass window of Benny's Billiards. And all you could see in the glass was the reflection of what was going on. So you had these two characters stood in front of it. The sky seemed to be, all the clouds were just whipping around as if to suggest that the character's world was completely changing here, which I think for Rusty James it was because he's starting to realise that his life isn't going to be what he thinks it's going to be. So I thought that was a fantastic representation of it. 
Matt Dillon then steps camera side. So you don't actually see him. You only see him in a silhouette in the reflection. So he's no longer the man he was. He's just an empty shell, which I think is what they're trying to show this, this breakdown of his character. And at the same time, you've got Cage. You see Nick Cage facing the camera, but you also see his reflection in the the mirror. Uh, so in the window behind him, he's the duplicitous character in this story. I, I thought this was fantastic. It was a really well shot scene. Like I, I proper loved this. I thought it was it's one of the best things we've seen. I thought it was brilliant. Rusty seeks out his brother. He's at the pet store. Apparently, he's always there looking at some Siamese fighting fish otherwise known as rumblefish. MB explains that if you shine the mirror just right, the fish will try to attack their own reflection. A great metaphor for the actions of Rusty. That night, MB and Rusty sit down with their father. Their father explains that neither MB or their mother are actually crazy, rather they had an acute perception. They were just born out of time. They are capable of doing anything but born into a world which gives them nothing to do. This is why they're so disparate, so de- so different to one another. Why w- Rusty will never be like Motorcycle Boy, no matter how hard he wishes and tries to be. MB steals, steals, MB steals a motorcycle outside, breaks into the pet store and rushes to the river to free the rumblefish. Before he makes it, he's gunned down by the policeman who has been a thorn in his side throughout the film. As the crowd gather around Motorcycle Boy's body, Rusty James takes the fish and completes the task, dropping the fish into the river. He then takes the motorcycle and heads to the Pacific Ocean, something his brother never managed to do. The final act finishes just under 90 minutes. Matt? Fucking the longest 90 minutes of my life. (laughs) (laughs) And I have been to Wars vs. Preston North End away and draw (laughs) 0-0. Like... um, (laughs) Yeah, I in League out. One. Yeah, I checked. I checked out a long time before the end of this. If I'm being honest with you, um, I, I it was it, it was done by about it was done pretty much just after that the last bit of Nick Cage. Love the scene. You're absolutely right about the scene. To be fair, um, I you know I liked the brashness of the dialogue basically saying, you know, you would never have been the leader of this gang and all that kind of stuff and seeing his whole life fall apart like that. But as I'll mention later, it's a fucking rip off of another film. <laughs> like it's massively a rip off of another film. <laughs> um, it's uh, yeah, it just, it just wasn't, it just wasn't for me this like, you know what I had flashbacks to birdie. Oh God! You don't ever think about Birdie. I had Birdie flashbacks with this this whole like transformation of character, and you know, there's oh God, I just yeah, this this um, I'll take the L, boss man. <laughs> Broke you, didn't it? This one, yeah. <laughs> Stu. It's it sounds like it's next to him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's. I, but at the same time, I know exactly what you mean about Birdie, but this was just better. It was just better than Birdie, and he did it in a better way. Mm. And I actually, in that bit where the um, they're about to shoot him as well at the end, and the cop, the cop kind of looks and kind of the nod, saying, no, leave him, he's okay. I was kind of, he proper got to me. <laughs> I don't know why. It's, it's not very long, like you just said. It's not a very long film. But I think it was almost like he was like he had issues, like he was on on the spectrum or something like that. How he was, how the cop was treating him. You think, well, mm. maybe he's got like kind of hero complex, and he's idolised his brother too much, um, and he just wants him just to do this and get out of his life, and then he'll he'll never see him again. But it proper got it. It was oh wow, that's that's in, that's moving stuff. And I really enjoyed it. I mean, uh, I should, like I said at the start, I should not look like this film at all. I should hate everything about it, but I really don't. I loved it. Mm. Yeah, I'm I'm completely in agreement with you, Chip. I really liked the the part just after Motorcycle Boy's death when you see Rusty James hitting the police car in anger, and you get that flash of colour that sort of feels like it's come out of nowhere, but it's obviously the release of the character from his um, from his cage of of always going to be in his brother's shadow. He's no longer there. So I thought that was excellent. I, just, I thought the whole thing was just really well done. I've got to be honest. 
Uh, the budget here was $10 million, which feels quite pricey for a 1983 film. Um, by way of comparison, Return of the Jedi, which is the big film of 1983, was made on a budget of $32 million. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more going on in Star Wars, so for it to have only been an extra $20 million just seems a bit odd. Uh, the box office return was $2.5 million, which according to IMDb makes it the 125th best performing film of 1983. The 124th best performing film was King of Comedy. So like some big directors quite far down that list. Um, obviously, none of us are really old enough to know what the film scene was like back then, but having Coppola and Scorsese so low down tells me that it's a very different world to what we're in now. <laughs> uh, obviously, I've already mentioned Jedi. The rest of the top 10 that year was Tootsie, Flashdance, Trading Places, War Games, Octopussy, Staying Alive, Risky Business, Mr. Mom, and National Lampoon's Vacation. Um, some good films in there, but nothing truly outstanding, I don't think. Uh, obviously, we've got some scores from IMDb and Rotten Tomatoes. Matt, do you want to go first and tell us what you think <laughs> they'll be? I think um, I think they'll be high for both. Um, I base this on the fact that I searched Rumblefish on Twitter to see kind of what the Twitter world thought of it if there was any, any hmm. and there's a, a surprising amount of actual activity over the last few months for Rumblefish. The, um, and I knew from that this was going to get its ass licked by everybody. It featured in a lot of like tweets that said, you can take any still from Rumblefish and it's a work of art. Very much down that line on Twitter. Oh, okay, and It's hard to disagree, actually, because you see some of the examples of what people have done and actually everything stylistically looks great. Um, so I've got no issue from that point of view. So I, I reckon you're talking 75 for 75 to 80 for, for the, for the people and 85 to 90 for the critic, I reckon. Okay. Stu, are you in agreement? Do you think that highly? Yeah, 100%. All right. It's a, it's so, it's so far up its own arse. Yeah, it nails it. So... I can't see it being low for either because I mean, the only way it'll be low is for people who are going in not knowing what it is and maybe going in because of the cast and then being a bit disappointed afterwards. But I think because it has such of this kind of reputation and like Matt said, if you, I'm guessing that he went on there to kind of just see if he was justified in his own thoughts because very wrong mm. he is. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Because I've done that before when I'm thinking, how is how do people like this? How, how is this possible? And then I look at it, everyone else loves it. I'm like, okay, well, clearly I'm, I'm in the minority again. But yeah, I, I have to agree with that. I, I can't imagine this being anything lower than an 85 critical. I mean, audience, yeah, audience, I'd say the same. Fair. Um, IMDb have got it at a 7.1. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes audience score is 80% and the critical score is 75%. So we're looking Ooh. at, what, four out of five mm. audience members liked it and three out of four critics liked it. So, yeah, good scores. Um, critical response, Richard Brody from The New Yorker, a myth-infused coming-of-age story that's directed with a grandly imaginative visual repertoire to match. Roger Ebert, this is a movie you are likely to hate unless you love it for its crazy, feverish charm. And Janet Maslin said, a number of the images in Rumblefish are more memorable than the film as a whole, sometimes for the wrong reasons. Um, the top critics were quite divided on it, whereas all of the, the rest of the schlubs were all very much pro the film. Uh, the fan responses, though. IMDb have given this a 4.4 out of 5, with 83% giving it a 4 or 5 star review. Um, I've got a 1 star review from Mark F. How many acting from Mark, uh, sorry, from Matt Dillon and Nick Cage? Mickey Rourke is good, but the weirdness of the film lets him down. Not worth two ninety nine, to be honest. <laughs> E.M. Ames. Rumblefish received a lot of negative flack when it first came out, but it seems to have grown a cult status in the decades since. 
apart from the excellent black and white photographic direction, I would say the original data's got it dead right. This is a slacker movie with embarrassing dialogue and a whole array of young actors trying way too hard to be cool. For a while, this manages to raise a few unintended laughs, but it rapidly becomes tedious and unbearably self-indulgent. It's a historical curio with themes that were done better before and have been done better since. Spot on. That that literally, that is well put and better than ever I could, but it's exactly how I feel about this film. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so carry on, Matt. Give us your good, bad and crazy on this one. Uh, oh, uh, must I? Um, so from, from, from the good point of view, the start especially, I was intrigued at first. I did think that, you know, it, it had something, it had charm, I guess, at first. And the motorcycle boy was intriguing. It was interesting that he wasn't this hard man and he was actually this, not a strong silent type, but he he was Chris Jericho's return when he talked very slowly and quietly mm. and was mean because of it. I thought that, that was good. Um, the bad, it, it, you know, it, it, it verges very high on the world at heart. A gram. <laughs> um, and I think I know why. I think I know why now. It, it doesn't resonate with me. Years and years and years ago, I had an unhealthy obsession with Final Fantasy X. And then it got remastered on Game Pass and I played it again. And I got bored of it so quickly because it's so much story, dialogue, story, dialogue, setting the scene, this, this and this. When I just, I just wanted um, a little less conversation, a little more action, please. Mm. And it just this is what I felt about this. I think it just needed more meat on the bone and less less foliage. Like that's just how I felt about it. And and I think maybe maybe it's just uh maybe it's just I wasn't in the right frame of mind to appreciate something artistic and I just wanted something a little more a little more dumbed down, maybe. You know what I mean? I can I can appreciate and it this links into my crazy, which is the absolute deep throating of this film online. Is bizarre to me. That, like, I, I think a lot of people like this film because it makes them sound clever or it makes them sound arty online, and it's one of those things where it's hip to be square. Okay, Stu, tell me he's wrong. Yeah, I think <laughs> you know what <laughs> what he's saying there is exactly how I feel about The Last Picture Show. I fucking hate that film with a, with a passion. It's the biggest load of bollocks I've ever seen in my life, and I had to watch it five times. <laughs> and uh, I fell asleep twice at, at the lighthouse, and I was like 18, 19 years old at the time, so that's kind of hard to do. It's the biggest pile of wank in the world, and people suck it off all over the place. Oh, it's amazing. No, it's not. It's shit, and it's boring. The good on about this is that it looks incredible, and like that one that one thing said about it, you could put any still of this, put it on a canvas, put it on your wall. There you go. You ain't bought that in BNM. That's amazing. <laughs> and you could do it with anything. And like I said about the fisheye thing as well. I mean the the I don't even know what the the proper technical term for that is, but everyone kind of knows what I mean. Um, even that worked in this. I think visually, it was great. I think the bad. I don't think the story was very original at all, really. And it didn't really need to be. But again, that's that's nitpicking. I mean, uh, did it need to be in black and white? Not really. I don't think it would have had that much of a... more of an impact to me if it was in colour and that maybe they'd done something else. If they put, like, fairy dust or something where his, his character comes out, it would have looked silly, yeah, but I didn't pick up on all this, the what the whole colour thing was about. So for me, it wouldn't have mattered too much. Um, but the crazy, I mean, the crazy is the fact that this was made by <laughs> the same person who made The Godfather. Because if you didn't know, the, you, the, there's never in a million years you put the two together. Not a chance. Yeah. Yeah, that, I think that makes sense. Because when you look at The Godfather, it's such a big huge story that encompasses generations whereas this is very much a story of one level told in quite a short space of time comparatively 
So I think that's actually a really good point. Wouldn't necessarily have realised that both would have been the same director. Uh, for me, on my good, I'll try and keep it concise because I, I really, really enjoyed this film. I thought there was a lot of good things to say about it. It's ba- it, You can tell that it is the work of a master director. I think that the performances that Coppola managed to get out of his cast is astounding. Like Mickey Rourke, to me, in my mind, he's this melted faced, co cleaned almost. Like that, that's pretty much all he's ever been in most of the things that I've seen him in. He's never been one to be an understated performer. And in this, he manages to deliver this this guy who's got so much potential, but is so not meek. Meek isn't the right word, but he's very much underplayed the character. And I think it works perfectly for him especially against his younger brother who adores him and his younger brother being quite brash and bold. And I just think it works so well together having those two characters. The camera work, like ranging from the shooting of the film on a stage, like there are parts of this that do look like it's a stage play. And then you get the excellent use of all the shadow and reflection, the, the black and white, which I think was used to show the differences between the brothers, that's why it was there. And then when the colour came in on the rumble fish, you had one fish that was red, one fish that was blue. Again, it was just to show the differences between the two brothers. That's why they used it. Rather than just giving it a, a you know a general colour palette, it was to highlight the differences in the characters, the black and the white, the red and the blue, not just shades of all the same thing. I think that's why it was there. So yeah, I thought it was I, I really thought it was excellent. The only thing I didn't like, I didn't like the score on this. There are parts where it almost sounded like Amos and Andrew, like not a serious film about the struggles of youth and young manhood. It sounded a little bit too slapsticky at parts. And I think that did spoil it at parts. Like there's one bit where you see him, he's not on the run, I can't remember who's on the run from. And there's just this weird sort of clickety clackety music going on. I'm like, this is really spoiling the moment. I don't understand what you're doing with it. So, yeah, the music really let this down, I felt. You know uh, what? I, I say uh, that's happened to me when I've watched a lot of, not just for this, like in general, films from the 80s where the score sounds stupid and silly. Mm. And maybe, mm. if, maybe that's just what this is. Maybe it's just looking back 30 years later. That it's an age, it's it's aged really badly, but at the time it was it was just one of the, it was the style of the time, maybe. Maybe that's be, all it yeah. is. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I've got a few IMDB trivia things and th- for, for my crazy. So Tom Cruise told Coppola that he wanted to work with him. He was invited to a workshop for a movie that Coppola was doing with Matt Dillon, which we presume is this film. Cruise left when he was offered the role in Risky Business instead. The name Rusty James is said at least 50 times in this movie. (laughs) That averages out to once every 108 seconds, approximately. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola has said this is in his top five films of his own work. And the other thing that I wanted to mention was how they actually filmed the Rumblefish scene. So what they actually did is they shot the, the two characters talking as they did throughout the rest of the film in black and white. They then projected that onto um, through a projector, obviously, and then put a colour camera in front of that projector shooting the fish. So it was a colour projector, sorry, a colour camera capturing the, the fish as they are and the black and white projector. So like for 1983, that's quite incredible how they managed to do that overlay when it took us a long time to get it again, which obviously is the Schindler's List shot that Matt mentioned earlier. So I thought that was quite incredible. So we'll move on to the questions now. Did you enjoy the film? Stu? Yeah, I really enjoyed it. And But the weird thing is, I enjoyed it, but I can't recommend it. <laughs> and Because... <laughs> I know if someone described this to me, I would hate it. And uh, I generally have no clue why I like this as, as much as I do, because uh, as I've said many times, it's not my thing at all. But there's just something about this film that it's magical. It just is. Matt? I didn't enjoy it, but there is no reason why somebody else wouldn't. I'm not saying this is a bad film. 
I'm just saying it's not a film that did anything for me. That's simply, sim- simply put, like I can see the positives for a lot of different groups of people that would enjoy it, but it just didn't. I've seen this film done and its themes done way better than, in my opinion, this was done. Take the cinematography out of it, mise en scène, all that, all that shite. When you come down to the core story, I've just I've seen it done better in in other in other mediums, so it just didn't resonate with me. Fair. Stu called it for me right at the start of this podcast. It's an Andy Gillard film. <laughs> like, I, I loved it. I thought it was excellent. I really did. Uh, based on this film and this film alone, was Cage good or was Cage bad? Matt? I actually think he was good. For the scenes he was in, He for the very limited um, screen time that he actually had, every scene he was in, he brought something to it. I don't think there was any. I don't think there was a lot of fluff from him. It's a shame he wasn't in it more. To be fair, mm-hmm. um, I had no problem with his performance. It wasn't dull. Um, his his dialogue was delivered well, and I thought he added to the scenes he was in, especially the, um, the scenes when he's calling out um, Rusty James for, for you know for not having the minerals to be the leader of the gang. So yeah, I thought that Cage was good. Super, Stu. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. It's 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 weird though. But it, I mean, it's almost like the kick-ass situation again, it? because every he's not in it anywhere near enough to really justify its its place on this podcast or on this list. But he's you know, everyone's performance in this film is great. I mean, we haven't even mentioned Dennis Hopper. Yeah, <laughs> and it, it, as a, the, the drunkard old dad. I mean. It, <laughs> Even he was superb in something that I've never, I haven't really seen do that kind of role before. But yeah, Cage, good. One for the good good pile, which has got to be on the up at the mini. That's the last few. Yeah, he's been on a bit of a, a decent run with us recently. And it, it's three goods for, for, you know, I'm well on board with that as well. I think everyone's really good in this film even with their limited minutes, like Lawrence Fishburne, only in a few minutes, but he seems the coolest cat in the world, which I think is what the character's supposed to be. Mm. Everyone maximised their minutes and did perfectly. So, yeah. Uh, So the final question, I need you to finish the sentence. If you enjoyed Rumblefish, you might also like. Stu? There's a couple. I mean, if you like gang stuff, then we've already mentioned the Warriors anyway. But if you want to look at... There was another one that... it was in my head. I couldn't pinpoint what it was until like about an hour after I'd watched it. I thought, oh, fuck, of course it is. It's Dead Man's Shoes. Oh, what a film. Are you, what a film. For a, a, a film about a relationship with, between two brothers, one idolising the other, in a slightly different way, but and with an English twang to it, go and just fucking watch Dead Man's Shoes again. Just superb. Mm, definitely. Matt, <clears throat> excuse me, Matt. Uh, basically, if you if you enjoyed this, um, then you need to watch Quadrophenia um, <laughs> because this is a direct ripoff of Quadrophenia, um, even to the point where Lawrence Fishburne is a direct ripoff of Ferdy, who walks around in a trilby hat the whole time. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's it's a coming of age story, not about brothers, but about brotherhood with friendships, realizing that you what you think is the next is the coolest thing going often doesn't turn out to be that way. And it even ends with a, not a motorcycle, but a moped as the final scene that, and as it <laughs> wisps off into this long shot. Um, and it's got stinging, which this film doesn't have. Um, <laughs> so for those reasons and those reasons alone, um, you owe it to yourself to watch Quadrophenia because it's a story as old as time. Um, we've all been there. We've all thought we were shit hot as kids and we were in the coolest gang and we wanted to be rock stars. And then you, when you look back at it, you realise that things aren't always what they seem and um, something, an event happens that changes the, your perspective on things. And I think Quadrophenia does it really well and it has a lot of similar themes to this. Mm, interesting. Because obviously Rumblefish is based on a book from 1975. So I wonder how many things we got between 75 and 83 that were actually influenced by this book anyway. Mm-hmm. So that'd be quite interesting to see what the um, if there was a rise in that genre of film during that period. Yeah, potentially. I mean, I don't... So Quadrophenia was 79, I believe. 
Yeah. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, I have a quick look to see if it was anything in relation to Quadrophenia is not a musical film because um, it's all about mods and rockers, isn't it? Um, Quadrophenia. Mm-hmm. So I know we have like rival gangs in 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 this, but we we don't we don't explore the other the other side at all. So yeah, yeah, maybe they were both kind of influenced by by this book. Um, mm, possibly, yeah. Interesting. It might be a bit like. Um... June, Star Wars June, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, very possibly. Mm. Uh, my answer is whatever happened to Baby Jane. I've got a, a slight different spin on it. So it's a 1962 thriller come horror film starring Bette Davis and Joan Crawford. It's a sibling story where the younger sister becomes resentful of having to look after her older, famous sister. Um, it's almost the exact opposite of Rumblefish, which I think is why I'd, I'd recommend people to watch it. There are similarities like the the exploration around mental health and mental illnesses that I think that was touched on in Rumblefish, but probably not as explored as well as it is in whatever, whatever happened to Baby Jane. Um, I think if you appreciate the adoration that Rusty James has for the motorcycle boy, it's well worth looking at the flip side of that coin with that film as well. So that's my recommendation. Uh, That's another Nick Cage movie in the record books. If you've seen this one or any other film, please get in contact with us. It's at cagefightingpod on the socials and cagefightingpod at gmail.com on the Twitter. Uh, Please make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes as well. Uh, If you could also leave us a review, we would love you forever for that. So for this week, Matt, would you like to say goodbye? Take it easy, everybody. Check in on your pals and look after yourselves. Stu, would you like to say goodbye? Goodbye, Rusty James. Goodbye forever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear that. I, you know what's going to be the problem now? When, we, when we're watching Chelsea, every time Rhys James is mentioned, I'm, I'm, it's already started happening at the weekend <laughs> when he was on the ball. I was thinking of fucking Rusty James in my head and it's going to be a thing there and I can't escape it. So no, you can't either. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> it's goodbye from me and remember. Be excellent to each other.